Everyone makes mistakes. I know I've made my share. Sometimes those mistakes have come from inexperience. Some are the result of being in a hurry and not thinking things through. And some mistakes are simply born out of stupidity. You gotta touch it. Okay, Jamie. You gotta touch it. Yeah. No! <laughs> You're the man, buddy! I can't help stupid people, but I can help you by sharing some of the biggest table saw mistakes I've witnessed over the years. Some of which are pretty common, and I bet you've done them yourself and didn't even know how lucky you were to not be injured. Each of these examples have the potential to send you to the emergency room, so pay close attention and let's get started. Overconfidence is a good place to begin because this can cause us to do many of the things that follow in this video. When we've gotten away with doing something careless a few times, we start to think we're immune to the danger or that it's been overstated. Not too long ago, I saw a large woodworking channel on YouTube demonstrating how to cut a tenon by putting a narrow board on end like this and moving it past the blade with his fingers alone. I can't tell you how stupid that is. If anything goes wrong, if the workpiece rotates slightly, if it tips, if it pinches or catches even a little bit, your fingers are going to be gone before you even feel the blade touch you. The thing is, I read through that video's comment section and I saw a lot of viewers defending such a reckless practice with the all too common refrain of, he's a pro, he does this all the time, he knows his skill level and his limitations. Clearly, he doesn't. Because no amount of skill in the world will save you when the inevitable finally happens. Just because you've gotten away with doing something careless in the past, even if it's many times, doesn't mean you will the next time you try. I've met a lot of nine-fingered woodworkers over the years across the country at woodworking shows and such, and most of them weren't inexperienced weekend warriors who were injured out of ignorance. They were pros, many with decades of experience who never thought it would happen to them. Overconfidence is perhaps the most dangerous table saw accessory you can have. An example of overconfidence is how a lot of people think they won't be cut by a table saw if they just keep their eye on the blade and don't touch it with their fingers. So you see them placing their fingers really close to the blade, like this when making narrow rip cuts, for example. What they don't realize is that you don't have to put your finger into the blade intentionally to lose a finger. A table saw can pull a nearby hand into that blade faster than you could ever react to keep it away. We'll talk more about how it can do that shortly, but for now, let me just say that it is imperative that you keep your hands sufficiently away from the blade so if something does go wrong, it can't be pulled into the danger zone. That means using some type of pusher for all narrow rips. How narrow? Well, as a general rule, if you can spread your fingers and touch the fence with your pinky and the blade with your thumb, then you should make that cut with a pusher. So keep one nearby at all times and use it for these narrow rips because just one quick cut can lead to one long day in the emergency room. It's one thing to use a pusher. It's another to use it properly. Engaging it too early before the workpiece is sufficiently supported on top of the saw can cause the end of the board to lift upwards and that can drop back down on top of the blade and potentially kick back towards you. Likewise, using a push stick that's way off center, like right over here by the fence, that can cause a workpiece to twist, particularly a small workpiece. And that could put pressure against the side of the blade and potentially cause a kickback as well. So learn to use your pusher at the right time when the workpiece is fully supported on top of the saw and centered as best as you can as you complete your cut. Table saws are designed to cut wood after it's been milled straight and flat. They're not designed to cut boards that may be warped or cupped or bowed. If a board is not flat, it can easily shift during the cut, especially as it's being ripped into two pieces. This can lead to a violent kickback and potentially a serious injury. So if you must cut a rough board, it is better to do it on a bandsaw. A table saw requires a flat surface to lay on top of the table and a straight edge to run against the fence. A table saw's fence is made for ripping. It is not made for cross cutting. If you try to run the narrow end of a long workpiece against the fence, you'll find it very difficult to keep that board from tilting during the cut, and this can cause a kickback. But how narrow is too narrow? 
Well, as a general rule, if the distance between the blade and the fence is greater than the length of the edge that you're putting against the fence, then you should treat this as a cross cut and use a sled or a miter gauge to guide and steady your workpiece as you make your cut. I call this a general rule because large work pieces may be easier to keep steady with the fence alone. For example, I might cross cut a full sheet of plywood at 50 inches, even though only 48 inches of the end of the sheet is against the fence. So use common sense. If you really have to try hard to keep the work piece steady, then it is not a candidate for cutting with a rip fence. When making a cross cut with a miter gauge, it can seem really handy to use your rip fence as an index. For example, if I want to cut five inches off the end of this board, I might be tempted to set my rip fence to five inches on the scale, lock it in place, put the end of my board against the rip fence as an index, and then use the miter gauge to steady it as I make the cut with the two together. The problem is this offcut can turn as it comes loose from the board, and as it does, it can become wedged between the fence and the blade and kick back at you. You have to keep the rip fence far enough away from the blade to allow for any potential movement as this offcut comes loose. If you really want to use the rip fence as an index, attach some sort of stop block well ahead of the blade so that you can reference off that before you proceed forward to make your cut. If this stop block is of a known thickness, such as an inch and a half, then you can just add that number to the scale on your fence. An exception to this rule is when you're making a non-through cut, such as when cutting tenons or lap joints, where all the material that the blade is removing is turned into dust, so there's no loose offcut that can be caught. This one is simple. Don't reach over the blade to retrieve an offcut until the blade has come to a complete stop. I've seen more table saw injuries caused by ignoring this rule than perhaps any other. If you don't have the patience to wait before you reach, you're too rushed and you shouldn't be working with the table saw in the first place. Another simple but often ignored rule is to keep your body out of the path of the blade when you make a rip cut. Rip cuts made using the fence are the ones that are most likely to cause a kickback. If a board does kick backwards, it can have enough force to penetrate the wall behind you. You don't want your body to be in its path. My next tip will be about how to prevent kickbacks from happening in the first place. But just in case, always try to stand on the opposite side of the blade from the rip fence so that if the board does kick back, it'll go past you and not through you. Most table saw kickbacks are caused by a workpiece pinching between the fence and the blade. There are a lot of situations that can cause something like that. I have a whole video on the subject that I highly encourage you to watch. I'll link to it below this video in the description below or also pinned to the top of the comments. Please check it out if you haven't already. Kickbacks don't just send boards flying. They can also pull your hand into the blade. And as I said, that's how most table saw amputations occur. People don't usually put their hands into the blade on their own. The workpiece pulls their hand there when a kickback occurs. Fortunately though, you can dramatically reduce your chance of a kickback with a simple little device, a riving knife or a splitter. Many higher quality saws come with riving knives. If your saw doesn't have one, you can make a blade insert that's equipped with a wooden splitter which serves the same function, to keep the wood from pinching on the back of the blade. Again, watch that video on kickbacks that I'll link to below to see how these simple devices can save your fingers. I'll also link to a tutorial about how to make your own splitter equipped insert. A riving knife or a splitter may be an essential safety device, but even more important is that blade guard that you took off because you didn't think you needed it. For one thing, blade guards have built in splitters. They also prevent all sorts of other injuries to your hands, your face, even your eyes. I know they can be a hassle, but they do work. I use my guard for virtually every cut. I only remove it when I must to show something more clearly on camera, as I am in this video, or for cuts that are impossible to make with it in place, such as non-through joinery cuts. I'm not the safety police. I'm not gonna come to your shop and nag you over your blade guard or anything else in this video. I'm also not perfect. And I'm sure you could find some cuts in the hundreds of videos I've made where I could have better followed my own advice. But woodworking, 
doesn't have to be a dangerous hobby. If you commit to follow the advice in this video, you will enjoy many years working with your table saw, keeping all 10 of your fingers intact. Now check this out. As the builders behind some of the top brands in the industry, Harvey Machinery has for decades been letting others take credit for their innovation. Now they've developed their own line of saws with the quality and features once reserved only for professional shops. The woodworking world is officially on notice. Harvey Machinery will be in the shadows no longer.